Disciple Up, number 178, Greater Than, a study in the book of Hebrews, the prologue. This is Disciple Up, the Disciple Empowering Podcast, where psychology, science, the real world, sin, self, and culture meet head on, and scripture rules. If you're a follower of Christ looking to grow or are looking for some biblical answers, then get ready because it's time to Disciple Up. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Disciple Up. My name is Louie. I'm your host for the show here today, and we're welcoming you to a very special episode as we are starting a brand new study in the book of Hebrews. Now, the way that I like to do studies here on Disciple Up is not to just like say start the book of Hebrews and every week until we're done do the book of Hebrews. I, I break it up. That way I can do topical things that interest me or that concern me. That way if something happens in the country, in the culture, in the world that needs to be addressed, I can talk about those things too. So um, yeah, this will not be every week, but we will be uh, working our way through Hebrews. And if you've ever read Hebrews, and by the way, if you haven't, I urge you to go read it now. And uh, well, as soon as the podcast is over at any rate... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> or you can just pause and go read it and come back. Uh, it's it's an amazing book. Either way, if you even if you have read it, you might want to reread it as we go through this study. And today we're just going to look at the prologue, which is the first four verses of chapter one. That's all. And believe me, that's enough. There's a lot of stuff there. So uh, I do want to let you know, if you would like to get a hold of me, if you have any feedback on today's uh, lesson... Uh, today's episode, I should say, I guess. Uh, If you have any ideas for future episodes, I'm always open to those. Or uh, if you just, you know, have any comment, maybe you want to tell me you think I'm full of it, whatever, you can do it. There's two simple ways. One, email me, louie, that's L-O-U-I-E, at discipleup.org. That is the home website for Disciple Up. Or you can, uh, if you have Facebook, go to our Facebook page and you can drop me a message there on our Facebook page. It is uh, facebook.com slash disciple up. So real simple to get a hold of me. I always enjoy hearing from people. I appreciate knowing what's going on in your life. Uh, that helps me shape this program and uh, share things that I know are going to be helpful to people because, I mean, you know, that's what it's all about. Now, today is September. We are in September, my friend. Yes, it is September uh 14th, believe it or not. And outside right now, I'm going to update my little phone here. Uh, It is 108 degrees. That's right. (laughs) That's where I live. Don't know what don't know what your temp is, but that's early fall here in the desert. So I will be sipping my sun tea from time to time like I always do because it's a little warm. Okay, having said all of that, let's jump right in and get going. Uh, No reason to uh, put things off too long. So here's the prologue to the book of Hebrews, uh, the first four verses, like I said. And uh, all the verses I'll be sharing today are from the ESV, the English Standard Version of the Bible. Also, if you'd like to see these show notes, which are four pages long, 1,552 words according to Word, uh, you can do so at discipleup.com. So here we go. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Wow, there you go. Now the reason I stumbled over that exact imprint I'm used to the, uh, let me just check the NIV. Yeah, the NIV says the exact representation of his being, and I think I'm still kind of used to that. I switched over from NIV to ESV quite a few years ago now, maybe five or six, 
or seven, something like that. Uh, I use all different kinds of translations, as you'll notice uh, on this podcast. But my sort of my base version, the one that I that I kind of go off of and refer back to, is the ESV. So, you King James only people, if you're listening, and you're probably not, but if you still are, you may hang me now. Okay. So let's get into this. And what we're going to do is rather than me try to give cute little titles to different sections of this and all that, I'm simply going to take it a verse at a time and just break this down into uh, the phrases that are used there and talk about them. So it's going to be kind of a very simplistic approach, you might say, but I don't think so. I don't think it's simplistic. I think it is simple, and I think it is a way to let the word speak for itself rather than me imposing my outline on it. Not that I'm anti-outline. I just preached a sermon yesterday, and it had an outline. But uh, sometimes it's good just to take the word as it is and let it speak, and then you know go back later and you can outline it and then do what you need to do. Both are valid approaches, is what I'm trying to say here. So let's look at verse 1. Long ago. Boom. Starts right off there. And of course, if you're a Star Wars fan, (laughs) you may be wondering, is this where they got that in Star Wars? Long ago in a galaxy far, far away. Um, No. And I think it was a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, right? So, no. No, no. He's, he's, He's talking about something a lot more important here. He's, he's trying to tell us something very simply, that God has been communicating with mankind for a long, long time. There's nothing new about God trying to communicate with his creatures. Started in the book of Genesis, right? He would meet with Adam and Eve in the cool of the garden, and then when, of course, they hid themselves after they had sinned, you know, he went and sought them out. And after that, he communicated with their offspring and on and on, Abraham and Moses and everybody, the prophets, all this stuff. So... Uh, so the idea of God communicating with mankind is not unusual to the Jewish mind. And remember, this letter, this book, whatever you want to call it, uh, was written to Jewish Christians. So to their minds. Now, it might be to yours or mine. I think if you walked outside today and asked people, do you think it's uh, unusual for God to communicate to mankind, assuming there is one? Um, I think most people would say, yeah, I, yeah, it seems strange. But to the Jews, it wasn't because they had that long, long history. And so they knew. And so the writer of Hebrews begins, and as we talked about uh, last week, no, I don't think it was the Apostle Paul, but anything's possible. Long ago, at many times... Now, it's interesting that God did not do this all at once. God scattered the prophets and other people that he spoke through throughout Israel's history. They're scattered through the whole thing. Uh, There are times when God is more directly active in the history of Israel than others, that's for sure. But you'll notice that he did this speaking at many different times. It wasn't like, okay, I tried and you guys wouldn't listen, so I'm done with you. Nope. God comes back and comes back and comes back and comes back many different times. God does not give up because God is love and his love is perfect. And so he wants to bring us into his fellowship again, into fellowship with him. He wants to forgive us. He wants to bless us. He wants to be good to us, but we reject that. And so he does what God always seems to do if you read the New Testament and if you look at Jesus in particular and if you look at the Old Testament as well when you know when people say no he lets them say no he does not force them I was thinking about that when I wrote my script excuse me for the cough there uh, for Tales uh, from the Scripts radio show I do every week on our local AM station you know when the children of Israel said we're not going into the promised land are you nuts those people are going to eat us alive yeah God gave them what they wanted. He didn't force them. He said, okay, you don't want to go? You don't have to go. So this generation, except for these two guys that are faithful, you're all going to die in the wilderness. I'm going to give you what you want. And boy, are you going to regret it. And they did. And the next generation, however imperfect they were, and they certainly were imperfect, they went, didn't they? So there you go. So at many times God has spoken, and in many ways. Now this is an interesting Um, turn of phrase here 
the NIV says in various ways. Um, and if you look at different translations, um, Message Bible says uh, different ways. Uh, the Living Bible does something interesting here. Uh, long ago, God spoke in many different ways to our prophet, to our fathers, the prophets, in visions. And they have a bracket there, in visions, dreams, and even face-to-face. Okay, so they're really going to town. Uh, so you could say various ways or uh, many ways, whatever. The idea is pretty clear here, and uh, that is that God doesn't just speak one way. Here's what Vincent in Word Studies in the New Testament says. He says, this refers to the difference of the various revelations in contents and form, not the different ways in which God imparted his revelations to the prophets, but the different ways in which he spoke by the prophets to the fathers, in one way through Moses, in another through Elijah, in others through Isaiah, Ezekiel, etc. At the founding of the Old Testament kingdom of God, the character and revelation, the character of the revelation was elementary. Later, it was of a character to appeal to a more matured spiritual sense, a deeper understanding, and a higher conception of the law. The revelation differed according to the faithfulness or unfaithfulness of the covenant people. And again, these quotes that I'm giving you come out of my uh, Word Search Bible Study software, and they're available in the show notes at discipleup.org. Now, something very similar is said in the New Testament. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10, it says, so that through the church, the manifold, notice that word manifold, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. The manifold wisdom of God. Now, that's a very striking term. Again, according to Vincent, the adjective occurs only here, and it means variegated. It's applied to pictures, flowers, and garments. In the Septuagint, it's used, for example, of Joseph's coat. Through the church, God's wisdom, in its infinite variety, is to be displayed. The many-tinted wisdom of God in different modes of power, different characters, methods of training, providences, forms of organization, etc. Now, I, I was very close to talking about something this week. I really want to talk about it. But I didn't talk about it because... It's a little close to a few things in my life right now, and uh, I don't want to just get on here and rant. <laughs> Which, if I had recorded this like four days ago, yeah, on that topic, you would have gotten a rant. And, you know, I just don't think that's a good idea. But what I want you to see here is that although the message, the gospel in our case, stays the same, the way it's communicated is very different. It's variegated. I love that word, by the way. Um, It applies to pictures, flowers, garments. It's different. It's different. Different characters, different methods, different names, different titles, different procedures, different ways to do it. You know, you can stand out and preach in public. You can go on the internet. You can write a book. You can can write a a song and maybe sing that song if you can sing. Uh, You can, you know, there's zillions of different ways to do this. So let's not get hung up on one or two ways to do it. Let's not complain about things not being the same and and then, you know, just not doing anything about it. That's why, uh, yeah, that's the thing I really want to talk about. But I, I got to wait a little while on this. You have to get a little perspective. I, well, you don't have to. Actually, there are some very famous podcasts, certainly far more listened to by far, far more people than this little thing is who uh, rant all the time, but I don't think that's what God called this podcast to be. You know, I I call this the Disciple Empowering Podcast, and I don't know how blessed or empowered you would be to just hear me rant and, you know, froth at the mouth when when things really get me going. And this is one of those things. So anyway, moving on, let's just point out that God spoke in different ways and at different times to the people of Israel. And then when Jesus came, the ultimate expression of God, the ultimate word of God, and this will all be laid out through this book uh, of Hebrews, he still takes that message and communicates it in different ways. It's still the gospel, but it may not look the same. It may not sound exactly the same. 
That doesn't mean it's not good. That doesn't mean it's not necessary. And that doesn't mean it's not important. That's one of the reasons why God made us creative people. Because we're made in his image and he's creative. And we need to be creative to get the gospel out. Okay. So, verse 1. Let's recap the verse since I'm tearing it apart like this. Long ago at many times and in many ways. Here's our next phrase. God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. Okay. God spoke in different ways through the prophets. Now, if you've read the prophets in the Old Testament, you know that to be true. Uh, for example, again, and Robertson points this out in word studies and word pictures, I'm sorry, in the New Testament. God spoke by dream by direct voice, by signs in different ways to different men, Abraham, Jacob, Moses, Elijah, Isaiah, etc. He also had them communicate to people differently. Now, usually they would speak, but sometimes they would speak, you know, stories or parables. And in Ezekiel's case, for example, he he would build things and lay on his side and he, he actually acted it out. So there's all kinds of different ways that God has spoken to people throughout the history of the world. And particularly, all kinds of different ways that he has spoken to the children of Israel. But the primary way was through the prophets. Now, the prophets, like I said, they were different and they communicated in different ways, but they were still prophets. Now, the word prophet basically means someone through whom God speaks. So, when you read the Old Testament prophets, you will see Isaiah and Jeremiah and others speaking for God in the first person. So they would say, you know, I am the Lord. I am the Lord your God, and here's what's going to happen. Now, they were not confusing themselves with God. They were simply allowing God to speak through them. So when a prophet prophesies, it's a very different thing than when I teach or preach or when anybody else teaches or preaches. Now, I know that today a lot of people like to look at that spiritual gift of prophecy and say that it's it's preaching and teaching. I think it can be but I think that the, if you look at the way the word is used, honestly and uprightly, and just you have to say that the primary meaning of prophecy is God speaking through someone to, to someone to an audience, whoever that, whether it's Israel or whoever. So God chose prophets to speak to His people, but He wasn't boring about it. He covered the entire history of the Old Testament. And so in many ways, in many ways, God would speak. And actually, it even covered part of the New Testament if you count John the Baptist as the last Old Testament prophet, which many people do, even though he's in the New Testament. Okay. All right. So that's verse 1. That only took us about almost 18 minutes, so that's pretty good. Verse 2. But in these last days... I've been asked twice in the last three weeks or so if I think we're living in the last days. And my answer is always the same. Well, when I, well, it depends, honestly. I, what I believe is always the same. I, I'll sometimes answer it a little differently because various ways to communicate things. But basically, what I say is yeah, we've been, we are living in the last days and we have been for over 2,000 years. So I'm not too excited when people say, oh, we're living in the last days. Yeah, yeah, so what? I mean, we have been. We are. And the New Testament teaches that. And right here it says that. But in these last days. So clearly the writer to the Hebrews here is absolutely certain that we are in the last days. He was not alone. In Acts chapter 2, verses 16 through 18, it says, but... This is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. In the last and in the last days, it shall be, God declares, notice that God is speaking through Joel, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirits, and they shall prophesy. Well, okay then. So when Peter says, but this, the apostles all speaking in tongues, is what was uttered through the prophet Joel, that means this was this prophecy here in this of Joel was fulfilled 
in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. So, are we living in the last days? Yeah. You've always been living in the last days. I don't care how old you are. (laughs) You're not that old. So, there is no one on the earth that is not and has not been for their entire life been living in the last days. Because, of course, as Peter says, you know, a day is to the Lord, it's a thousand years. So, you know, we could be in the last days for quite some time now because you're dealing with God and God is not a being that is uh, in time or trapped by time or consumed by time. And we are all of those things. No, God is outside of time. He created time. He made it up and he's not bound by it. So it's not what most people want to think it is. Now, I'm 67, and I remember living through quite a few times when everybody thought that was it. The 1960s, you know. Barry McGuire, before he became a Christian, wrote that great song, The Eve of Destruction. You don't believe we're on the eve of destruction. Last days, man, last days. The Jesus People movement that sparked up in the late 60s and into the early 70s, depending on where you were. They were all about the last days and the second coming. And I actually knew people who, you know, got swept up into that and then walked away from the faith when they looked around four or five years later and said, you know, it hasn't come yet. I don't I don't I don't buy this stuff. And they had actually joined up out of fear of the second coming, not out of real faith in Christ. And so. That was sad. And so you have all this stuff that happened. You know, in the 80s, he was going to come. And then a couple of years ago, that guy had, you know, people all selling everything and, you know, because he was going to come. And people on a fairly regular basis predict the date of the second coming, and they're always wrong. So when people say the last days, are we living in the last days? Yeah, we are. But that doesn't mean that, that I expect, you know, the Great Tribulation to start next Thursday. I mean, I I have no idea. It could. I don't know. Uh, But what I do know is is that we've always been in the last days uh, throughout all pretty much of Western civilization, you know, all the way back to the time of Christ. So, you know, we just need to be not hung up on dates and times. We need to be hung up on am I ready? Because that's the only question worth answering. Okay. So that's my little thought on that one. So if you're worried about these last days with the fires and the riots and the thing and the deal and the whatever, um, I say focus on Jesus and don't worry about it. If you're ready, then you're ready and you don't have to worry. And if you're not ready, well, then what difference does it make if he comes next Thursday or 10 years from now? You're still not going to be ready unless you get ready now. So get ready. In these last days, verse 2 says, He has spoken to us by his Son. Ah, here we go now. Now we've sort of taken this look back over the history of mankind and God's work in the Old Testament. And now we come to Jesus, exalting Jesus. This whole book is about exalting Jesus and showing the superiority of Jesus and his covenant to the Old Covenant. Now, when it says has spoken there, that's the first aorist indicative of a Greek word, laleo. Uh, And so it means that he did speak in a full and final revelation. Okay, God has spoken now in his son, that's it. That's why Christians and uh, do not accept, and I certainly absolutely believe this, anybody else coming along saying, no, well, now I'm the new prophet, you know, Muhammad did that, and we do not accept him because God has fully and finally spoken in Christ. So when you have these people that run these cults come along and say, well, God's given me this revelation, and now I, no, I don't accept you, Joseph. Sorry, you're not my prophet. You're not a prophet of God because God spoke fully and finally in Jesus. That's it. Now, there is something interesting here in this in, in this. Uh, phrase he has spoken to us by his son and that is the absence of the definite article before the word son you would probably expect it now they don't usually translate it into english so it 
if it was there, it would not read in your English Bible, has spoken to us by his, the son. <laughs> but it's just there oftentimes to, to sort of emphasize, yeah, this is the son of God. But it's not there. Now, here's what Vincent in Word Studies of the New Testament says about that. He says, attention is directed not to Christ's divine personality, but to his filial relation. While the former revelation was given through a definite class, the prophets, the new revelation is given through one who is a son as distinguished from a prophet. He belongs to another category. The revelation was a son revelation. Christ's high priesthood is the central fact of this epistle, and his sonship is bound up with his priesthood. So the focus here is on the fact that Jesus is not just some another guy who comes along that God uses. No matter how wonderful or devout or spiritual that guy was, whether it's Moses or Isaiah or Ezekiel, uh, you know, or Abraham or anybody else. No, Jesus is in an entirely different category because Jesus is God in human flesh, according to John chapter 1 and many other verses. Check Colossians out, which we did a study on here, etc., That's what we want to focus on. God did speak through the prophets, but now, now the final and full revelation of God is given to us in his Son, and by his Son, and through his Son. It's awesome. It's amazing. That is the greatness of Christ. So when you approach the New Covenant or the New Testament, you are approaching not only God speaking, but you're approaching God speaking not through just a, a person that he's chosen. You are approaching God speaking himself. He himself became a man so that he could communicate this to us, so that he could provide the sacrifice we didn't have, so that he could show us it is possible to follow God in this life and that he could overcome death and hell and that's what he did that's amazing or if you want to be picky death and Hades yes I know the difference you can send me a note if you'd like (laughs) louis at discipleup.org okay so that's it notice the contrast back then he spoke in many different ways many different kinds through many different people but now now he has spoken to us in his son wow by his son Okay, so there's a definite, distinct, and even dramatic, I would say, contrast there that we want to pay attention to. Now, has spoken. Okay, then we looked at that. So now we want to look at the next phrase. Has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things. Again, this is an heiress. Now, the heiress tense in Greek is a is a past tense, but it's but it's a specific kind of past tense. It it means something happened at a particular point in time, and the ramifications from that event are still rippling through time and space today. So it's timeless heiress. It, it happened once. He appointed Jesus heir of all things once, and that's it, and then nobody else is going to be the heir of all things. Okay? Um, there you go. So the idea... Of sonship easily passes into that of an heir because obviously the, that the firstborn son would normally be the heir. But look, Jesus talked about this even before his ascension into heaven. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 27, it says, All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Hmm. So this is in Matthew 11. And Jesus says here, all things have been handed over to me. Now in Matthew chapter 28, of course, at the Great Commission, he repeats it when he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been granted to me. So all authority, he has it all. And he says the same thing here. So he is the heir of all things. He was appointed it, boom, it will never be undone, and he is the heir. 
He is the one. Again, building up the greatness of Jesus. Do you see how the author of the Hebrews, in just a few words, is able to exalt Christ in a way that I don't know that I could do if you gave me 500 times those words? <laughs> um, yeah, it's amazing. He is the heir of all things. But we're not finished yet with the greatness of Jesus. Oh, no. No, no, we're not going to be finished till we finish the book. But look at the next phrase in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2. Through whom he created the world. Well, holy smokes now. Not only is he, not only is he heir of all things, not only is he God's son, not only is he the one who brings us this final revelation, but he's the one who made everything to start with. And again, this is taught throughout the New Testament. Probably the most famous passage, which I alluded to earlier, is John chapter 1. And I want to read the first five verses. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that has been made. In him was life, and the life was was the light of men the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it so there you go jesus is the word jesus is god all things were made through him the word and without him was not anything made that has been made so john here wants to make sure that we don't miss this right because he basically tells us the same thing, one in a, in, in a positive way and the other in a negative way. All things are made through him. Now you might think that would be sufficient, but John knows that this is a pretty big thing to say about someone who walked around on earth, who got hungry and thirsty and tired and was crucified. I mean, he was a man, but he wasn't just a man. He was also God in human flesh, and so he repeats it negatively, says, without him. And I like that little phrase, without, by the way, because what that shows me is that, of course, what uh, John is alluding to here is the fact that the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, were all involved in creation, and there are plenty of verses to back that up. Without him was not anything made that has been made. Okay, is that clear enough for you now? <laughs> It should be clear enough for us. If we miss this one, boy, we're really just not paying attention, okay? There you go. So, again, Jesus now is exalted even higher. He didn't just create the earth or the world. He created the universe. And all those parts of the universe that we don't even know about or can't see, like the subatomic world and the, you know, and the quantum world that we're discovering now and trying to figure out, all that stuff, he made it all. That's incredible. But we're not done yet exalting Jesus. Nope. You might think that would be enough, but no. Chapter 1, verse 3. He, Jesus, is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. Okay, the Greek word there for radiance means to emit brightness. And it's used only here in the New Testament. Uh Philo used it in his writings. It's used in the Apocrypha once, at least. Uh, it can mean either reflected brightness, uh, Calvin and Thayer talk about that, or uh, effulgence, that means the ray from an original light body, which is what the Greek fathers held to, that the light came out of Jesus. Other people say he's reflecting the Father's light into the world, like the moon reflects the sun. Both senses are true, of Christ in his relationship to God as Jesus shows in plain language in uh, John chapter 12 and John 14 where he talks about know, everything I say comes from God, everything I do but then he calls himself the light of the world the writer is using metaphors which had already been applied to wisdom and the word or the logos that's what Moffat said the meaning suits the context better the meaning effulgence uh, effl it's E-F-F-U-L-G-E-N-C-E -E. I should have looked up how to pronounce that properly but that's my best shot at it. <laughs> Suits the context better, though it gives the idea of eternal generation of the Son. The term the Father applied to God 
uh, involving his son. So there you go. It's basically what he's saying is is that the radiance of God's glory, that is Jesus. He is the radiance of God's glory. If you want to see God's glory, and I lot of people, oh, see the God, glory of God. Well, then you look at Jesus. Now, the next part of that phrase, the imprint of his nature, is an interesting word. And, and it comes from an old Greek word, uh, karso, which means to cut, scratch, or mark. It, was, it, it first was the agent or tool that did the marking, and then the mark or the impression was made. The exact reproduction, a meaning clearly expressed by this Greek word. Um, so this is the idea of, of like if you scratch something, that scratch is the exact representation of, say, the point of the nail or whatever it is that you're using to scratch it. Now, the word hypostasis also appears here for for being or essence of God. Uh, and it's actually, interestingly enough, a philosophical rather than religious term. If you've studied uh, early church history and if you've studied the creeds, the formation of the creeds, you know that they fought over that word like forever and a day. And I'm not really going to get into that because I'm uh, well, I haven't really studied it in a long time, and I don't really care, to be quite honest with you. <laughs> they could argue about it all day long. I'm just looking at what it says in Scripture, and that's all I need. So, okay. So, but this is Jesus. He created the universe. He is the radiance of God's glory, and he is the exact... I actually like the word. For me, it seems to make more sense uh, to say exact representation of his nature, imprint, whatever you choose to use there. But... So that's it. He is the exact imprint of God. So when when people met Jesus and came to know Jesus when he walked on the earth, they knew God, which is exactly what Jesus said. You know, when he was asked, hey, couldn't you just show us God? That'll be enough for us. And <laughs> Jesus said, really? Well, okay, he didn't say really, but he did say, have you been with me so long and you don't know? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. There you go. Now, this next phrase is really interesting. Uh, like, they're all really interesting, but I learned some stuff here looking at this today. Um, it says, he is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature, and, as if that's not enough, <laughs> he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Whoa. He upholds the universe. Now, some Bibles, older versions translated that maintain or maintaining here's again uh, what word studies in the new testament says about this upholding conveys too much the idea of the passive support of a burden uh westcott who's a great greek scholar quoted someone i don't know who the quote where the quote comes from says the sun is not an atlas sustaining the dead weight of the world unquote Neither is the sense of ruling or guiding, as Philo wanted to translate it, who describes the divine word as the steersman or pilot of all. What the Greek word here says, according to Vincent is, or Robertson, is that it implies sustaining, but also movement. Now this, I'd never really looked at before, so I found it very interesting. It deals with a burden not as a dead weight, but as in continual movement, as Weiss puts it, the with the all in all, its changes and transformations throughout the eons, unquote. It is concerned not only with the sustaining the weight of the universe, not only with sustaining the weight of the universe, but also with maintaining its coherence and carrying on its development. Now, this was written a long time ago, okay? Like you're talking late 1800s. And that is a phenomenal statement given what how science has developed to this point because we know the universe is moving, right? The galaxies are moving away from each other. There's movement in every single thing. And, you know, your body is constantly, even if you're not moving, if you're a couch potato, it doesn't matter. Your body's moving. Your heart's pounding. Your blood's spinning. Your cells are dying. New cells are being reproduced. Things are happening. There's constant movement in everything in the universe. It's not static. It appears static on the surface. But when you get down on the atomic and subatomic level, and especially when you get into the quantum level, it's like craziness. There's constant movement everywhere all the time. 
Jesus is the one who sustains or upholds all of that. And he does it by the word of his power. How interesting. He speaks and things happen. How did God create the universe? He spoke. He said, let there be light, and there was light. It's kind of interesting because some people have written these things. I, and preachers used to read these things, and I hated them so bad. Where he talked about God. God in the Garden of Eden bent down, and he, he took the dirt or the mud or the clay or whatever, and he shaped it. Blah, blah, blah. No, he did not. He spoke, and things happened because he is the almighty, immortal, all-knowing, all-seeing, all-everything, <laughs> present everywhere being he doesn't have to get down there and like carve a figure out of the dirt and say okay now I'm going to make you alive no he just speaks and it happens Jesus through his word speaks and the universe is sustained and it's carried on to its proper place throughout the ages because the universe will come to an end just leaving aside scripture revelation for a moment, science tells us that. Now, scientists will argue about what kind of an end, and that's fine. You know, some think it will just, you, eventually we're going to lose heat and energy, and the universe will just simply wind down and die out. Other people think it's going to sort of reach a point, and then it will contract, and then you'll have another big bang, and blah, blah, blah. But the point is, is that scientists today know the universe is not going to last forever. You know, trillions of years, maybe, but not forever. So, now you plug the Bible into that and you see that Jesus is sustaining and guiding and moving the physical universe as well as the spiritual universe towards its proper end. Now think back about the question, are we in the last days? Yes, and God is guiding us towards the end. Wherever that end will be, whenever it shall happen, I couldn't tell you and neither can anybody else, but that it's being guided by our Lord and Savior Jesus, that's something I don't think a lot of people think about. That's a good phrase. If you want a f something to meditate on, any of these phrases that I've looked at today so far will do, but I would suggest thinking about that one. Okay, but we're not done yet. He goes on, because we're not even to verse 4 yet, people. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Now, okay, this one sounds more familiar. The way this is written, according to word studies in the New Testament, it indicates that the work of purification was done by Christ personally. It was not something which he caused to be done by some other agent. He made purification for sins himself. High? Whoa. How? By allowing himself to be condemned? by going to the cross. He carried the cross till his body gave out, then it was carried for him, and then he stumbled up that hill, and he allowed the people he had made to take the nails that were composed of atoms which he had spoken into existence and drive them through his wrists and drag him up to the top of that cross and then put right foot over the left and drive another spike through there and kill him. That's how he made purification for sins. The verb denotes a solemn, formal act, the assumption of a position of dignity and authority. When it says he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, the idea of sitting down, it's not, he wasn't sitting down because he was tired. <laughs> uh, you know, which is why I usually sit down. No, no. I remember when I was walking the Camino in 16 and in 18. Man, you know, you I, I took, I didn't take enough breaks, quite frankly, which is part of the reason why I banged my legs up and my foot up so bad. But um, when you could, when you would just, you know, sit down and stop for a little bit, it was like, oh, man, it was nice. Um, no, this is the assumption of a position of dignity and authority. The reference is to Christ's ascension. In its exalted state, he will still be bearing on all things toward their consumption, still dealing with sin as the great high priest in the heavenly sanctuary. Now, we'll get to this whole great high priest in the heavenly sanctuary stuff later. If you've never studied Hebrews, I'll just tell you right now, things are going to get confusing and pretty technical. And I'll try to keep it simple enough, at least for me to understand it. 
But we'll see how that goes. Now, all this, of course, reminds me of Ephesians chapter 1, verse 20, which says that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. So there we go. So Jesus pure, provided purification for sins by his death, burial, and resurrection. He ascended into heaven after he rose from the dead. He is seated at the right hand of majesty of his Father on high. So again, we're exalting Christ beyond anything the human mind can actually really comprehend. And then he wraps this up here in verse 4, and he points us now towards the first of many arguments he'll make in this book, Chapter 1, verse 4, having become as much superior to angels. Ah, the superiority to angels is one of the first things we're going to talk about in Hebrews. Now, I know most of you probably couldn't care less about that, but I also know there are a lot of people running around today that are all into angels. And, ooh, ooh, talk to angels. And, ooh, I found this thing. This could be an angel. And I had one person ask me. They just didn't understand why I was just, as a Christian and a pastor, not excited about this. And I said, well... The you know, I couldn't really explain the Bible to her because she knew Zippo about Scripture. So I just said to her, why would I want to talk to an angel when I can talk to the one who sends out the angels? Why not just go to the source? Why not go talk to God? Why bother with angels? And she, and you could tell this was not something she had thought of before. <laughs> she just said, oh. So hopefully that planted the seed there. Now, in Word Studies in the New Testament, it says the informal and abrupt introduction of this topic goes to show that the writer was addressing Jewish Christians, not Gentile Christians, Jewish Christians, who were familiar with the prominent part ascribed to angels in the Old Testament economy, especially in the giving of the law. Okay, that's right. Jewish Christians came out of a Judaism, in the first century Judaism, where angels were revered. They were feared very much. That's why in the New Testament, in the uh, Christmas story, for example, when angels appeared there, every person they appear to is always afraid because they were taught that if an angel shows up, that's because you've really messed up and God's going to zap you. But they did revere the fact that, that angels were involved in the giving of the law and all of this stuff, and they had this whole thing that they had developed. So to Jewish Christians, this was a big deal. I don't think Gentile Christians then or now, most of us, quite frankly, really care, but they cared. So we're going to talk about it, whether you like it or not, because it's in the book of Hebrews, <laughs> whether I like it or not. So verse 4, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Now, this is a comparative statement, and it's the, the way it's written is only found in Hebrews, in the sense of more excellent. And then uh, the earlier sense of this word that's used there is different. The idea of difference is that which radically distinguishes that, distinguishes it from better. So in Word Studies of the New Testament, he argues that it's presented, here it presents the comparative of a comparative conception. The son's name differs from that of the angels and is more different for good. So what he says, um, maybe. I think the name, of course, Jesus if that's the name he's referring to, or is he referring to um, Savior? Is he referring to Lord? I mean, those are titles. So it depends on, I guess, how you want to look at this. But um, any of them and all of them are superior to angels. Jesus, Yahweh saves, that's superior. Christ, the anointed one, that's superior. Savior, Lord, whatever, they're all superior. So any way that you... Look at it from any angle that you want to take this. Jesus is superior to the angels. So when you hear all this angel talk, just don't get excited. Most of it's baloney. Most of it is not biblical. Um, and even if it were, we are called to follow the Son of God, not an angel. So if the angel, you know, pops up in your bedroom and says, Hey, I'm, you know, here to have you go out and dig in your backyard and dig up some silver plates and blah, blah, blah. Uh, I'm going to say, go away. Because I have the full and final revelation in the sun. I don't need any plates. I don't need that. I've got 
the final word of God in the word of God, the scriptures, and in the person of Jesus Christ. And that's it, and that's all we need. So don't be fooled by these experiences people have with angels. Now, people say, did, did, did that really happen? I don't know. I don't know. And I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. Because just because something real is something is real doesn't make it right. You can have real, authentic, life-altering experiences from the evil one just as surely as you can have real, life-altering experiences with God. And the way we know that what we're dealing with is of God is if it matches up and goes along with his word and if it is all about Jesus and his gospel. Because if it's not, you may have a problem and probably do. And with that, we are going to wrap up today's program. Hope that you enjoyed this episode, the introduction to the book of Hebrews. We've got a lot more coming on that and other stuff as well. So uh, thanks once again for listening. If you could, please, 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 please share this with your friends. I would be very grateful if you could do that so that we could try to build up our audience and get more listeners. That's always a nice thing. Uh, and you know, and it's not because I'm making money off it because I don't make any money off this podcast. This podcast is not monetized. I pay for, you know, it's sitting on Libsyn and all that stuff. That's all coming from me. I don't really want any money right now. I just want to get this word out and to bless as many people as I can. So having said all of that, this is Louis again saying thanks for listening. God bless you out there, everybody. And remember, every time is a good time to disciple up. So. Disciple Up, the Empowering Disciples podcast, is written, produced, directed, in as much as there's any direction to this thing all, edited every once in a while, and paid for by Louis. It's his personal ministry, and it's not connected to Christchurch on the river. CCR does not sponsor, pay for, or necessarily approve the content found therein. The theme music for Disciple Up is Hot Wheels by Varensky. Yes, Louis actually paid for the rights to this very cool piece of music, so don't worry, and please call off the lawyers, as he's busy enough without having to deal with all that. All opinions expressed during Disciple Up are Louis and Louis alone. They do not necessarily represent those of our sponsor, the Lord Jesus Christ. However, where the opinions, thoughts, impressions, and feelings shared are in line with God's Word and faithfully represent what our Lord says in His Holy Word, the Bible, then they are representative of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you're wondering how the heck you're supposed to know this, remember, God tells you to test all things. Hold on to the truth. It's up to you to do the due diligence that God commands, so do it. Don't whine about it, and don't complain about how hard it is, and don't blame me for it. Disciple Up, and do what you know you're supposed to do. If you'd like to know more about Louis or Disciple Up, please go to discipleup.org and check out everything you find there. Or not, it's completely up to you. Disciple Up, the Empowering Disciples podcast will, God willing, publish an episode every week covering different areas of concern to disciples of Jesus. If that's important to you, then please subscribe on iTunes, Google, Stitcher, or another one of the many podcast aggregators available to you. If it's not, then don't. If you'd like to get in touch, please email Louis at louis at discipleup.org. God bless you.